Thank you so much, Adrian, for following suit from Haisha Bilher, the uh, head of research at the National Archive in Abu Dhabi, who spoke last yesterday in Kalba and began to show the way in the relationships between what can be found in terms of African diasporic motion in the Gulf of Oman and along the Indian Ocean as much as can be found from the Gulf of Mexico uh, and the Atlantic Ocean. So this uh, paralleling, comparing and contrasting of uh, these two diasporic modes across different bodies of water is that upon which look for me all around you is predicated. It is this attempt without ever seeking truth for as Glissant advocated, nothing is true, everything is alive, but through practices and protheses, maybe not so much of embodiment, but very much of enfleshment. And thank you, Adrian, for bringing us back towards the matter of the skinless and the epidermicless. Um, it is very much through these lens that I have approached Look For Me All Around You, so that here together, our learning experience is one that is inscribed within the moment, beyond the surface, indeed beyond the scopic regime. I I thank Adrian also for directing us away from the rhetoric within which Look For Me All Around You is very much embedded, that of fugitivity. You have heard me speak of fugitive forms, indeed they are, but I appreciate the call away from fugitivity, still very much embedded within the idea of the fugitive slave and of the very fact of slavery, but towards errancy instead, which does bring us fully within the fold of globalizing and an ongoing process of diasporization that is not solely inscribed within migrancy, but more generally within other forms of transfer of matter and data. And um, lastly, I also wanted to thank Adrian for highlighting two of the tutelary figures that inform Look For Me All Around You, prime upon them Marcus Garvey, from whom the title of this um, presentation is derived, Look For Me Around You, Look For Me in the Whirlwind, and of course also Fanon so brilliantly brought back alive his radical politics in the work of Mohamed Borouissa's Brida Joinville, which we also saw yesterday and which we will be able to see through that the duration of the biennial. And I think this is going to be my second and hopefully last Lastly, thank you also, Adrian, for highlighting a few of the artists in Look For Me All Around You who are very much bringing into life so many of the various organizational principles of blackness, which, as you so well described, are not so much racial as much as they are structural in terms of understanding a way of being in the world regarding, regardless of the limitation of uh, the visible uh, color of the epidermis. I will not say anything anymore before bringing onto the stage Jay Clayton, who has already been brilliantly introduced by Adrian. Thank you. Let's see. Is this, yeah, so if, if Adri Adrian spoke about varying manifestations of blackness, I'm going to speak about varying manifestations of white noise. Um, and so thanks to Claire and the Sharjah Art Foundation for bringing me here, and thanks to you all for gathering to listen. One of, to me, one of the most beautiful things about this particular site as a soundscape, the soundscape of Sharjah, is that it has two of my favorite sounds. And the first is the sound of the sea, um, which is the longest running natural cycle as the sea comes up to the shore. And the second is the call to prayer, the azan, five times a day all over the Muslim world for the last 1,300 years, that has been clocking life, urban spaces, rural spaces throughout this incredible, incredible area. And that is the longest running human produced sound that's happening with regularity. And both of those two sounds, the sound of the sea and the call to prayer, they're both of course um, clocked by the tides, clocked by lunar cycles. And they encourage us to think not about time as a linear experience, 
but about nonlinear time, about patterns of sustenance, um, and about different, broader, dare we say, spiritual clockworks happening. Um, but we're here, gathered for an international art biennial, which is happening in a very different time scale, right? And the thing about contemporary art is this notion that all these objects made were somehow pointing our fingers towards something happening in this moment, towards what does it mean to be alive and with all the complexities and all the problems right now, what are different ways to express that, what can be communicated by art that can't be communicated in other fields. And so if, if contemporary art has its emphasis on the visual, on visual modes of understanding, you know, clarity, clear subject-object distinction, I would like to propose the idea of a contemporary alarm as a counterpart to that that's based on listening. So in a contemporary alarm, we turn to our ears, we turn to ways of understanding the world and the world's urgencies through sound. And so if I think of what's the most, what should be we be alarmed about the most right now, then I immediately turn to this issue of climate change and global warming. That's the one issue that unites us all, all together on this planet, whether we want to or not. And so what would an alarm about global warming sound like? And I think the answer to that is white noise. So white noise is, you know, it's, it's also that. But white noise is static. It's the sound of randomness. But it's also the sound of air conditioners. It's the sound of cars. Um, it's the sound that you hear when you're taking a transoceanic plane flight and you get this roaring in your ears. And so I would like to say that everyone who is exposed to those sounds, AC units, car noise, um, plane noise, we all have a very strong response. That should be understood as an alarm getting us to think about what global warming means and how we can, th how we can react to that and fight it and then think through it together. And of course, individuals don't cause global warming, um, but those privileged among us, everyone here who's taken a plane to get here, who's staying in a hotel AC room, um, we are in a position to affect the narratives, to affect the shifts of thought, to affect the ways that we are thinking about global warming and interconnectedness in this very tense and very urgent moment. You know, so the question is, how can sounds lead us into urgency? You know, and so if, if that's one moment of white noise that we should hear as an alarm, there's another one which is related. And this is the white noise outside the therapist's office. You know, so in 1962, the white noise machine was popularized as an aid for sleep. It was a little, little machine that would help you get to sleep at night. But as therapy became more popular, as the neoliberal individual was slowly constituted, white noise machines went from helping you get to sleep towards helping mask the words that you're talking to your therapist. So it's this idea that, you know, the, the modern individual narrates their individual problems to the person. It's all terribly important, and therefore we must have this white noise making sure that your problems are not being heard, making sure that nobody can hear it, um, this personal narrative. And so I think that that type of white noise um, should also be an alarm to the flip side, to this other aspect of global warming, which is to say we live in an incredibly interconnected time individual stories, individual narratives. They're wonderful things, but all of the important problems, everything that really matters, is no longer individual in that way. And so this idea that white noise can operate as a shield protecting your private interior um, needs to be put to the side. And as a counterpart to those two types of white noise, alarming is how I would like to hear them, um, is white noise as pleasure. And so here we have to talk about white noise and pop music. So the most famous drum machine is the Roland TR-808. It was made in 1980 by a Japanese engineer, a brilliant man, and he realized that if you took white noise and played a very small clip of it, it would sound like a snare drum. It would sound like a great snare drum or a cymbal. And so what he did, he listened to all of these analog transistors trying to find the one that had the best sounding white noise. 
And in the end, he found a box. This box had 12,000 broken transistors, but they made the most incredible white noise. And so he said, this is it. I'm going to build a drum machine around these broken transistors. I'm going to make 12,000 copies of it, 12,000 versions of this machine. And when it's done, we stop production. And that became the Roland TR-808, which is, like I said, it's the most legendary. It's incredibly expensive if you buy one. Um, used everywhere, you know, Kanye West's 808 and Heartbreak, but almost every pop song will have some sort of 808. But the use of white noise there is a very interesting flip side to the drones of air conditioning units and the drones of white noise out in, ther in therapist's office. Because that is white noise, it's like a homeopathic dose. Um, and specifically, what the snare does in the context of popular music, electronic popular music since the 1980s, is it, it marks time. You know? So this is the era when drum machines were first coming into popularity, which means regular thump, 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 thump beats. But people would use these bursts of white noise, these snares, to mark the swing, to mark the off-kilter moments, to let listeners and dancers know that even though the machine was being hyper-regular, there was always moments to curve and to dance within that, between the grid and the flow. And another beautiful thing about the TR-808 and white noise is that computers can't create white noise. Computers can't make random numbers. They can only calculate and give you specific quantities. But of course, in the world, in the analog domain, randomness, chaos, white noise is everywhere. Um, so what he did was by honing in on this moment in the 80s and taking analog white noise, but that speaks more broadly to the lack of serendipity, the lack of surprise in digital environments and in algorithmic uh, structures and how we need to introduce certain levels of white noise. And of course, thinking of a pop song, the time scale of a pop song, it's immediate, you're in it, in the sweat, in the moment, and it offers a sort of attenuated moment of this white noise, something that we can understand as pleasure rather than warning. So, sort of in conclusion, if the sounds of air conditioning and plane roars, if that's a type of white noise that should cause to wake up and, th and think about interconnectedness, to think, you know, my little room, our little room with our environment versus the world, um, isolated and apart, that's no longer sustainable, that's no longer possible to maintain. As quickly as possible, we need to think about fostering these deep interconnectivities. We need to think about all sweating together. What would that look like? What, how would that become? And the white noise of the therapist office white noise machine, that to me is saying that, you know, we are no longer in the time of individual narratives. The heroic artist with her piece, his piece, you know, the heroic author, the person on stage lecturing, individual stories are no longer the stories that are the urgent ones and the ones that need to be told. We need to think about new ways to turn individual, to acknowledge that all of these discussions are a chorus, that it's interrelative, that it's echoing, um, that we are many and not scattered little individuals. This notion of an I is a little bit of mental feedback left over. And finally, the white noise of the 808 drum machines a reminder that no matter how big the <laughs> scary sound might be, there are always ways to find that moment of human pleasure and sensuousness and funk and detournement within that system. So, I, my name is Jace Clayton, and I do have an artwork here. And it's in the corner pocket. It's on the ground floor there in the back. And I think of the piece over there as a kind of opposite of white noise. I was thinking about what does it mean to create a social polyrhythm. You know, and so in that room, there's a series of um, small analog electronic synthesizers that are cabled together in various ways. But it's powered by no master tempo. With a laptop or whatever, there's one clock metering out time. One of the things you can do in analog domains is to have a bunch of interdependent clocks, each of them slowly affecting the other, slowly affecting the speed, and also transforming the sound. 
So it's a composition which shifts and moves. And there's also these bass thumb pianos that you can play. The thumb pianos are unamplified, but when you touch them, they give electrical signals and the sound of the synthesizers reacts and the overall tempo and pacing of the piece reacts. So I was trying to think of a way I could use very basic electronics to create a complex quasi-living being. I was thinking of a way in which the community that is Jace could interact with the community of wires and electronics um, and to think about what would a sonic ecosystem like, be like, where it's meant to be dynamic and open and relatively stable, but it's going to change and transform and invent itself as it runs and as people play with it throughout the course of this biennial. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.